Paul taking the podcast, man. We back again, man. I'm so distraught right now. I'm throwing off. I was going on. Let's give the people an introduction. Uh, so I'm Joey. I go by Cyforce, and this is my instrument, the Vectophone. It's uh, an instrument that I made um, out of open source electronics like Raspberry Pi and 3D printing, and a program called Pure Data. And it's um, meant to be able to play and improvise electronic music in real time. So this is a one of one? Is this the only one that you've created? For now, yeah, this is a, this is it for now, but uh, my goal is within the next year or so to have uh, to make the whole thing open source so that anybody can build it themselves. Oh man, I hope you have a patent on that already, man. So, what is your plan for, what is you, is the xylophone? Uh, vectorphone, so like, like a vector. Okay. So this is a, uh, this has accelerometers in it, so the angle of my hand will change the sounds. So is As it like magnetic forces bouncing off of each other? Or what? Uh, it just uses, it senses the force of gravity and then it, you know, changes the angle based on, you know, with relation to gravity. So gravity is always going down. And uh, if I go like this, then gravity is going to pull in this way on it. And if I go this way, gravity pulls this way. Just like with your smartphone, you know, you flip your smartphone and it knows which way is up, right? Yeah. So, uh, it's kind of the same thing. It's the same type of sensor. And I'm um, using that information to control the music. Different, different so effects. So how did you, how, how did you get into this? What is the story behind it? Uh, so in 2011, I watched a TED talk called This is Beat Jazz by Onyx Ashanti. And uh, Onyx Ashanti is uh, a street musician turned maker who, who made his own instrument kind of along these lines. Um, and these days he's doing all kinds of other things. He's building a whole like uh, mesh, 3D printed mesh like suit, kind of cybernetic suit thing right now. And um, he's doing all kinds of stuff. But uh, when I saw his video, he had something like this with two hand units and a breath, u breath unit um, that was his own instrument and he played a set just kind of jamming out um, and playing, you know, electronic music in real time instead of sitting there and putting in some MIDI notes and then arranging it all. And it's a different, different process. Uh, as a musician, um, you know, I came from playing guitar, playing bass and you know, you can sit down with a bunch of musicians and, and make some music on the fly, you know, just improvise and jam out. And so that's what I wanted to do, you know, even when I got into electronic music, I didn't really feel, wasn't really feeling the process of sitting down at a computer all the time. And, um, yeah, because that's kind of a big jump from guitar to electric music. It's like, were you always into the electric sound? You just, or, or played the guitar? Or um, how did that, that happen? Yeah, well, I, uh, I was studying music um, at UC Irvine, and I was playing guitar there, and uh, I played in the jazz, jazz band there. Um, and so I'd get together with my friends a lot, and, and we would just jam out and, you know, do for like a few hours and just <laughs> kind of go totally far out. Um, but the way I got into electronic music was I just uh, started going to uh, a local club down there that's pretty famous called Focus, and um, they have house music every Tuesday night, and including like a lot of the big, big names like Mark Farina, or you know it's run by Josh Billings, who's a pretty well-known house DJ as well. And um, yeah, after getting into house music, I started going to like desert raves. Um, I've never been to a rave. I hear they're crazy. Is it really a rave in the sense of what they're talking about, like mosh pits, and or is it really as bad as they try to uh, make it seem? Um, well, I don't know who they are, but <laughs> <laughs> well, the outsiders, like the outside yeah. looking in, we we look at raves as like mm. crazy things, like oh, man, all type of drugs and crazy orgies and mm -hmm. all type of weird stuff. 
we assume is going on, but we've never been, so we really don't know. Well, uh, I don't, I don't know exactly how to answer that question. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I'll just say that uh, it's really about it's really about the music and the dancing and like, you know, when you talk about drugs, it's not like people are out there like shooting heroin or doing meth or something. It's mostly like psychedelics and, okay, and so it's you know, smoking weed and stuff. Like, <laughs> so it's a lot of it. You know, it's just from a chemical perspective. That's a totally different. Uh, yeah, I, I'm then. thinking of a bunch of like drug zombies out there just swaying the music, you know, just the picture that I have, uh -huh. everything that I've heard because mm -hmm. of all the stigmas that come with those type of events. Yeah, and, you know, if you look back in history, drug use has been stigmatized for a long time, um, going back to like Reefer Madness, you know, in the, in the 20s. Um, and it's always been kind of like racialized too, you know, like we call it marijuana because they wanted to associate it with Mexican, Mexican immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, if you look at, you know, like now it's like cannabis is legal in California, you know, like <laughs> we don't look at, we don't really look at pot as like being this like negative addictive thing that will drive you to madness anymore because that's what they said it was at the time yeah. but that was all you know mis disinformation um, and it's the same the same is true about most drugs to be honest and a lot of the harms of drug use not to say that there aren't harms from using certain drugs but a lot of the harms just comes from you know misinformation you know a lack of education and like prohibition so when you make something illegal you know, the only place you can access that is on the black market, you know? Yeah, and on the black market, they're cutting all these drugs with fentanyl. Yeah, exactly. And selling you fake drugs, and that's causing a lot of the overdoses. And a lot of the overdoses aren't actually on the real drugs. They're from fake drugs. So the, the stigma of people dying from drugs mm -hmm. is kind of a falsification because they're dying from fake drugs, not the real ones. Yeah, um, if you... Yeah, and you know, for example, like ecstasy. Yeah. Uh, you can go on like PillReports.com and find, you know, tests of different pills, and they don't have MDMA in it. You know, yeah. <laughs> MDMA is the the drug people are trying to take, but that's not what's in a lot of pills. So, um, you have people taking things they don't know what what it is, and then you know, then you don't know the dosage of what you know. You exactly. you don't even know the the the, the substance, let alone the dosage. Exactly, it's a and dangerous so, game. Also. Yeah, so uh, it's not to say that MDMA is dangerous in and of itself, but you know, you, you're in a situation where it's only available through the black market, and you have to really, you're putting a lot of trust in your supplier to, you know, basically be honest about what what it is you're getting from them, and um, you know, even in the best circumstances, it's still not always. There's still no guarantee of that it is what it what you think it is or what you hope it is. Exactly, so. man. So it's a dangerous game. So mm -hmm. is it a lot of drug selling at these raids? Do people come with their drug pre purchase? Or is it like an uh, underground ring and she you just or is is it like free drugs? Are people just giving out drugs for free? Because I've seen that also or heard of that when people just are out there giving out all type of drugs at these raves like, just yeah and again like the word to me the word drugs <laughs> is a bad word it's it's not a bad word it's just a very loaded word when you're when you're saying the word drugs yeah. there's a lot of judgment and um kind of a lot of uh preconceived ideas yeah. about what that means and um i, I get what you're saying yeah. now like uh, for, just by, yeah. by putting it into that category, you know, it's already got that med negative connotation behind it. Exactly. Yeah. So these raids, from I, I hear though, are, are time of people's lives, man. And once you go to one, it seems like people go to all of them after that. They get raved every time that they can. So it's obviously a good time, man. And it, it, maybe I'll experience one one day, you know. I had tore my ankle in a mosh pit at uh, the Rolling Loud concert.
concert, man, during a, a little Yachty performance. And that was about as ravey as I've ever gotten. And it ended pretty bad for me with a, with a torn uh, tendon in my ankle. Uh -huh. So I don't think I'll be raving too hard from now on, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 and it's the, scene is, the scene has like developed a lot, you know. I mean, it's been like 10 years since I went to my first like party parties and uh, it's definitely like changed a lot from then even and um, you know it's not just like, like all it's not just like you know massives where there's like tens of thousands of people and it's not just you know there's a whole scene of different types of events and so it's more, more culture involved in yeah there's a lot of culture and uh, a lot of community too because a lot of people you know, it's like kind of, you know, a lot of our chosen families are at, you know, go to these events and um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, to say that it's just about drugs is, uh, is a huge, <laughs> is a huge, over, is a huge uh, oversimplification and, um, yeah, I guess as a musician, I was attracted to it through uh, the sound, you know, there's something really interesting about what a computer or what a machine can do with sound that, you know, we can't really do with like a guitar exactly or, um, you know, through with other instruments that we had in the past. And so for me, just from a sound perspective, there's a lot of sounds that I was drawn into that brought me into this culture. Um, and from there, it just uh, it just kind of evolved, and I found a lot of amazing people in that scene as well. So I met you at the uh, last Soul Sesh. Uh -huh. So how what was your relationship with Future Soul? I know you performed at a couple of their events now. Uh -huh. uh, how did how did that come about? Yeah, I I, I uh, met Marissa from Future Soul at uh, an event that my friend Brandon organized called uh, HippieCon. And uh, they've been doing these events that are kind of focused on, you know, like healing energies and uh, like conscious hip hop and um, meditation and things of that nature. And so uh, I've been doing kind of like meditation sets and uh, or like sound bath type um, performances at those events. And uh, Marissa met me at, at a at a hippie con a few months ago, and then, you know, we hooked up and we've, she's invited me to play Future Soul, and I just have been doing their events since then. Yeah, man, I really love what they're doing, man. They're bringing a community and culture back to downtown San Bernardino, back to the San Bernardino period. And a lot of what they're doing is hip hop based, and it's showing the community that there's a different lane of hip hop. It doesn't have to come with all that rah rah, you know, aggressive energy that hip hop typically brings with it. There's more conscious and uh, vibrant hip hop out there that we can do that uh, fits the vibe and the culture of the youth. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and giving the youth something positive to do and to look forward to out here is inspirational in itself like I seen uh, the the one that they did at a uh, wet paint Larry studio mm -hmm. unfortunately I couldn't make it I had to go to work but just from what I seen it looked like an amazing time were you there um, yeah that was um, at the art studio right yeah 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 so uh, that was a great event and uh, a lot of people turned up and uh, there were a lot of great performances. So studio looked crazy. Yeah, they, they have uh, all kinds of art on the walls. And I know, like man, just the timing you have to put into just decorating the studio itself. Uh, it's just crazy dedication to his art. You yeah, know what I'm saying? for sure. Like he, you can tell he literally loves to do what he does. He wakes up and does it every day, mm -hmm. and that's the dream for everybody: is to be able to wake up and do what they love so consistently mm -hmm. that you don't think of it as work, you know what I'm Yeah, saying? yeah. Yeah, that's so a whole, whole outside, topic. <laughs> out, outside of this, what do you do for a living? Is this, because I know you have 
have to be into some type of com computers or something. Uh, you create this. No, I actually, I don't exactly have a background in computers. Uh, I went to school f to be a computer science major, but then I switched into music after my first year. So I only have about a year of uh, programming classes. I don't have any kind of degree in it. But um, yeah, I just, uh, after college, I went to teach English in China for a few years, and then I moved back, and I've been substitute teaching since then. So I'm a substitute teacher by day and a musician by You, you kind of look like night. a substitute teacher once you say that. <laughs> <laughs> so ch I'm teaching in China, man. Uh, How's that? So uh, you speak Chinese? Yeah, I speak Chinese. How, how did you learn that? Was that a, a choir thing, or was that something you knew pr you prior to going? Um, well, yeah, I took I took a year of Chinese classes in college, uh, and then when I graduated, I wanted to keep learning it, so I just moved out there and like kept learning it on my own. Um, I took like Latin in high school, um, so I never spoke that. <laughs> it's a dead language, so I always kind of regretted not taking a language that you know I could actually speak to people with because I really admire people that speak more than one language. And so, uh, you know, when I got to college, I had, you know, I took the chance to, to take, you know, Chinese courses for a year, and I didn't want to just, like, forget everything and lose it, so I kind of moved out there and figured that'd be the best place to learn, <laughs> so just going up, going so out So how was the reception being a white American in China? Um, that's, uh, yeah, there's, I mean... The first thing you have to understand about China is that a lot of China is very, like, racially homogenous. It's not like Southern California where there's people from all over the world out here. Like, mm -hmm. you know, your neighbor, your neighbor's on one street. What's next for the, the Vectophone? Uh, next for the Vectophone. So, um, the way I, the way I did the design, it's still kind of a work in progress, but. Um, I'm hoping to finalize a little bit of the design and then um, turn it into kind of a kit, a DIY kit, where you will come with all the parts, like the instructions will all be on online. People can order the kit and build their own Vectaphone, and then and then they can play it themselves. That's crazy. Uh huh. That's a that's a beautiful idea, man. So, I, do you have a team behind you, or is this all a solo project? This is pretty much just me. I've tried working with a couple other people, but it's hard uh, for people to kind of commit as consistently as, you know, I've been working on it. Um, so it's pretty much, pretty much all me. Obviously, I have a lot of help from, like, um, you know, the, for example, the, the program I use called Pure Data, which is where I do all the, the programming for it. Um, that's an open source program, and so there's a, there's a big you know, community of users, pure data users around the world, and uh, I've had a lot of help from, from people in that community, you know, just to learn how to use it and, and, you know, solve different problems and stuff like that, but as far as, like, everything, all the design of this and the programming, it's pretty much all uh, stuff that I've done and just figured out myself over the years, so. Okay, so when's your next performance? Do you, do you have anything lined up on calendar? Your next event you'll be at? Uh, yeah, so the next event I'm uh, playing is actually HippieCon, which I mentioned earlier. Okay. And uh, they have an event in Rancho Cucamonga uh, this Saturday on the, uh, was it the 26th, I think? I should, uh, I should have looked this up already, but... <laughs> yep, the 26th. I think it starts at 5 p.m. But uh, you can check out... Um, you can check out their page on Instagram. Their uh, their Instagram is at hippiecon family, and um, I'll po I'll post about it as well on uh, my Instagram is at cypher sounds. That's P S I F O R C E sounds. You finding it right now? Yeah, yeah. I'm getting it right now. So hippiecon. Hippiecon, yeah. It's crazy. Do you have the link in your bio, or do you? Um, 
Well, the link in my bio right now is to uh, my album that I released okay. last month, or this month. So it's on every platform? What, what, what's the name of the project? Um, Let the people know. Yeah, the, the album I just released was called Trickle. Uh, and it's it's like a collection of some of my older um, older work, but I had, um, before before I made this instrument, I was doing a lot of uh, kind of compositions and recordings using pure data, um, a lot of like pretty deep kind of experimental electronic music, and um, yeah, I released that on Bandcamp this month. Um, so I just started to move away from SoundCloud. SoundCloud has a lot of kind of weird changes going on right now, so yeah. I decided to, that Bandcamp would be the best platform for it. And uh, it's still actually available. Uh, I, I release it as a Name Your Price album, so you can you know, pay zero dollars if you really want to download it for free, or you can give me a few bucks um, to download it. And, um, and yeah, I have that, that album out on Bandcamp, so. Is there any visuals that are coming with that, or is that the next step? Um, visuals with the instrument? Yes, with the, you know what I'm saying? Uh, oh, with, for the album? Yeah. Um, well, I just have the album cover that I made <laughs> myself, but, um, yeah, mainly, um, mainly what I'm trying to do is, I have two albums of kind of back release to, to go through, mm -hmm. so I have uh, one more album of um, to release probably before the end of the year, and then uh, then I'll start putting out um, kind of uh, I have an album that I'm working on. It's basically just little, almost like little journal entries. Um, you know, just little improvisations or jams that I did with the Vectaphone, uh -huh. and uh, I just have a folder of them waiting to just put out there. So. That'll be the, not the next one, but the one after the next one. Okay, so you got, so it, you got it all. I kind of have some back stuff that I'm just kind of slowly releasing out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, from there, uh, once I do that third, that third album, which is kind of going to be like an ongoing thing, um, then uh, I'm planning to do a lot more, like, composition and uh, do something more that's, like, kind of a whole coherent album that's maybe like themed or has some kind of journey because that's really my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. You know, all my favorite music is like one long album that like just flows in this kind of journey that you can listen to from beginning to end, you know, and then, and then hit repeat, you know? <laughs> for sure, so. for sure. So, let's get into some other topics, man. Sports, right. how you, you grew up watching sports? You're a sports fan? Um, I don't really watch uh, like team sports so much. I I grew up like as a skater, so I used to skateboard and I snowboard and stuff like that. So you into the X Games, so, that type of stuff, huh? Yeah, kind of. I mean, like I like uh, I like like skate videos or snowboard videos or whatever, where it's kind of like it's kind of like art in motion, you know, where they have it's all probably, the shots and there's like music, set to music and stuff like that. It, it's, it's a big lane now. It's, extreme sports has been part of the Olympics for probably the, what, the last two Olympics now. Um, so, so it's, yeah, at least I would, I would yeah, say. Yeah, so extreme sports has taken a giant leap as far as people accepting them as real sports, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It used to be kind of more like a stuntman where you were just doing it for, for the love, you know what uh -huh. I'm saying? Instead of actually it being looked at as a true sport. You know what I'm saying? And that's why you have a lot more children that are going and getting on bikes, going and getting on skateboards mm -hmm. than we used to because it's an actual lane, it's an actual sport. You can get uh -huh. sponsorships, you can get all type of uh, deals, clothing line deals, you know, it's all type of, it's, it's a whole lane for extreme sports that didn't exist, you know, that people don't really pay attention to. but. It, it, it's crazy, you know, how you can make a hundred million doing snowboarding. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, uh, you can have your own video game franchise. I know. Like, <laughs> 1080 was a crazy one. Did you yeah. ever play that? I played 1080 and, like, Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Yeah, close. man, those are crazy, man. 1080, though. Once I learned how to do the 1080, <laughs> I felt like I, I, I conquered the world, you know. 
Yeah. Because it was like one of the hardest things to land. Tony yeah. Hawk, after you got the hang of it, it was kind of like you, once you start doing the specials, uh-huh. it kind of got ridiculous. Like, you couldn't, nobody could really do that many specials. Yeah. And, and consistently like that, but yeah. it was a video game. But yeah, as a child, it's super fun. <laughs> as a child, you hit that special moment, and you, you blink and yell up. Mm-hmm. And you just hitting every trick you could possibly hit. Like Tony yeah. Hawk was one of the greatest. And then you create the when they can put it so you could create your own skate park. Yeah, that was crazy. Cause yeah, I was more <laughs> I was more of a grinder. I love to do the different grind specials. Uh, Go from fifty fifty to a, uh, a backslide to a nose rail. You know, I uh, was a grinder, so I love creating different parts that I could put all these grind rails on mm-hmm. right yeah. when I exit a ramp. You know, it was crazy. Yeah, I think you're not alone there. <laughs> <laughs> video yeah. games aren't what they used to be. Like, like right now, the only video game I play is uh, 2K. And I think that online games kind of killed the old, uh, the old way of gaming. Now, if the game doesn't have some type of online mode, and I don't want it. It's purposeless. Like, you know, like in 2019 going forward, you have to incorporate some type of online multiplayer into your game, especially when you're charging 80 bucks a game now. It's like, mm-hmm. it's crazy. Like, I, I play 2K and it's like the whole virtual world mm-hmm. where you run around with your basketball player and play basketball. And it's like the funnest thing ever. Like, women hate it because men be on there with their friends for hours. Women hate all video games. Mostly, unless it's a few women that are gamers themselves, but for the most part, women hate video games. Um, I think that's maybe more than you, more than you think. But I, uh, I yeah, I, uh, I haven't played video games that much in a long time. So I've been, I've been kind of in my room working on this thing for a long time. So oh, so that's your your focus. That's your hobby, huh? Yeah, I've, uh, I've played a couple games over the past few years, but not like, like definitely Netflix. not like I did when I was in high school. <laughs> Man, in high school I didn't really even play video games. It was mainly like middle school. Yeah, I guess. Middle school, we used to go to your friend's house, play video games yeah, that's all true. night, like mm. literally till six in the morning, you'd be go to sleep for an hour and wake back up <laughs> and keep playing, you know what I'm saying? Those were the good old times. Yeah, just when, laying the foundation for a healthy behavior for yeah, the rest of our lives. I know. <laughs> but, but we used to play outside. That's the difference between this us and the old generation. Uh-huh. Is we used to play outside all day and then play video games all night. Mm-hmm. They're just playing video games all night and all day. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's no outside behavior. A lot of the kids are, are in real life, they're socially awkward because of the internet, because of the video games. On the internet and the video games, they're as lively as can be when it comes to being social in real life. They have a lot of problems, you know what I'm saying? It's a thin line, man. It's like, what do you do? Uh-huh. Um, you yeah, do? it's kind of hard for me to say because, you know, I do work with kids, like, almost every day, and, uh, the only thing is I can't really compare to when I was a kid because my only perspective then was a child's perspective, you know? Yeah. So uh, what was I like at that age and how would I compare to somebody now? I mean, it's probably something that I might be able to say about it, but... Uh, you see, but that's the one honestly, thing... Honestly, think, I think kids now would, you know, have you know, access to so much information. Like, you know, I think when we were growing up, the Internet was just starting and there was only you know, a little bit of stuff on there, like, that was before Wikipedia, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and kids now, like, have the benefit of a whole decade of, you know, development on the internet, and, you know, I guess it's good and bad, but, um, you gotta hope that people are out there doing, you know, what's best for themselves and the people around them, and hopefully, hopefully it kind of balances out. <laughs> So, any movies you're looking forward to, man, what's, what's coming out now? Uh, like, the last few movies I've seen have been duds. I've seen that Gemini, man. That was a 
I thought it was going to be good off the previews, but the storyline sucked. It dragged on, and the fight scenes were kind of fast and furious, like, mm -hmm. you know, too animated and too fake. And then, uh, I seen the Joker, and that was kind of a, a weird one. I, I don't know how that, uh, how to categorize that movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I haven't been to the movies in a long time. I tend to find stuff on Netflix and just stream most of the time. Um, I'm trying to think of something that I watched recently. Uh, I guess the last thing I watched was uh, this show called The Expanse. It's on, uh, it's on Amazon. Uh, it's like a sci-fi series. And what what is that on? It's uh it's on Amazon. It's uh. What's the basis of the show? It's set, I don't know, maybe a few hundred years in the future, um, where humans have started to colonize Mars and the solar system. Okay. And then we get. So it's an off-world setting. This. It also happens on Earth, but it's a very different Earth from today. So, um, what is the fascination with Mars? Is it like a, a Earth-like atmosphere? Does Mars have oxygen? Um, Why are we trying to be so fascinated with inhabiting Mars? Yeah, well, personally, my opinion is like, you know, we better figure our, figure our situation out here first. Like, if we, we can't be, you know, Messing up Earth and thinking like this is going it's going to be it's going to be a lot harder on Mars, obviously, and you know we have to have our climate stable here and, and things like that. The environment has to be functioning here. You know, if we've if we've ruined uh, all of Earth's ecosystems, we're not going to have anything to do with Mars. You know, we're never going to get there. Um, but I think as far as like a futurist perspective, like if we can solve Earth, we can figure out Earth and kind of like make it work here then um, you know we could potentially s start ecosystems on Mars you know like if you look at something like permaculture where uh, people are growing food for us in the, in the desert you know what I mean like there's a lot we can do in terms of like building an ecosystem from the ground up which is uh, you know something that maybe we didn't know we could do 50 years ago or something and so you know, if we, uh, if we manage to, you know, stop capitalism from destroying the earth in the next 10 to 20 years, then we might have a chance of, uh, of, uh, making it to Mars and so, doing something So you there. believe that capitalism is the problem? Yeah, absolutely. Um, greed. It's, uh, capitalism is an ideology founded on greed. Yes. Yeah. The greed behind the, the system breeds the corruption and this is why every democracy has failed but this one so far but well no who knows how long this one is gonna last but throughout history every democracy has crumbled because of capitalism and greed and the greed that it breeds so as long as america is a superpower and it's a capitalistic system inside a republic it's, it's, it's a dangerous ground we're playing mm -hmm. on, man. So, yeah, if you, so, uh, so what did, 2020, do you have a candidate? What is, what is your um, what is your preference on this presidential race? I mean, we pretty much need Bernie to be the Democratic candidate. But uh, do you think that he's going to get it? Because Biden, I think Elizabeth Warren is uh -huh. the leader right now. And then Joe Biden is second. I think Bernie's third right now. Yeah, well, Biden is, Biden is, you know, the new Hillary. <laughs> uh, yeah, if, exactly. If we have Biden, it's going to be 2016 all over again. We're going to have four more years. So that's just, that's just the reality. Mm -hmm. It's only, like, it's only these, you know, corporate donors that think that Biden actually has a chance. Um, and... Because I would like to like Elizabeth Warren, you know, we just need more progressive politicians, but if you kind of look down in her, at her policies and her record, she's not as progressive as she 
comes off. So I kind of fear that she's like, she's like an Obama candidate. You know, she's, she says, you know, change is, you know, she says we need change, but then what is the, what's going to be the real result? You know, Obama bailed out the big banks, you know, he increased deportations, he, mm -hmm. like, increased drug bombings, mm -hmm. like, you know what I mean? Drug bombings, for sure. Yeah. And people like, don't even know how many times he drunk. And he would go to the UN, and the UN would say no, he would go to Congress, and Congress mm -hmm. would say no, and then he would just send drones. Yeah. And it's kind of fucked up, like, they're, they're clearly telling you that what you're doing is wrong, and that's why they're not backing you. Yeah. So you just send a drone instead. Mm -hmm. And there's not kind of no no ordinance or no kind of governing over these type of uh, attacks. Yeah. And you can't really tell who the drone is from. Everybody has drones. Did you catch the drone and get the serial number and you know it was our drone? Because if not, then you can't even prove that that drone strike was us. And it's yeah. kind of a tricky game, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, um, I mean, until we can defund the military industrial complex <laughs> you know we have uh like something like 40 percent to 50 percent of our national budgets goes to the military until we can until we can rein that in like we have no chance of of you know doing things real things for the people in the country like building infrastructure um you know education like single parent health care like these are like a, these are like the bare minimum of things that we should be shooting for. So since you're Bernie, uh, Bernie's your candidate. Do you believe in a free college, in a free community college? Or do you like that basis? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I'm, I'm still paying. Uh, I graduated in 2010. I'm still paying off my student loans, but you know, so yeah. um, I don't think that's necessary. And like. The cost of college tuition has gone up so much, and when you look at who is really benefiting, it's still benefiting corporations because there's so many private companies that are benefiting from research that public colleges, uh, you know, research universities are doing. You know, they'll they'll take something that's been researched by one of these big universities and they'll just turn it into a product, and you know, the university might see some of that money, but that money is not going back to the students. You know, it's going to you know, research or maybe, or it's going to, um, you know, build complicated facilities or something. Not the to, students aren't really benefiting from that. Not to mention all the money they get from sports. Mm -hmm. It's like the, these, these universities are raking in big dollars. Yeah. And because they're non-professionals, uh -huh. the students get like the short end of the stick. Yeah. And they get stuck with all this debt. Yeah. And, the reality is, you made all this money off me being here in the first place. Yeah. Why should I leave in debt? Yeah. Also. Yeah. It's it's one big game, man. But, but that's again mm -hmm. feeds into capitalism. If we weren't in a capitalistic system, these universities wouldn't be able to operate mm -hmm. in the manner in which they do. Mm -hmm. And capitalism is a gift and a curse. You know, it's serendipity. There's positives to it because, as a creator, I can go out into a market space and fill the void or, or make my own path. Mm -hmm. But then again, if I make my own path, somebody can come copy what I'm doing, put a little bit more money or resources behind it and take everything that I'm doing mm -hmm. and take Shasta Cola and become Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Take Coca-Cola and become Pepsi-Cola. You know? And, and the originator kind of gets pushed to the side, you know, in the background. Well, uh, I kind of disagree for a couple reasons. Uh, the first reason is that the market itself is not what capitalism is. You can have a market under socialism as well. So the market is not what defines capitalism. What defines capitalism is the ownership structure. So uh, under capitalism, you know, the person with the, the capital, the money that, or the resources that starts up uh, an organization is entitled to 100% of the profits, whereas what ca capitalists pay the workers is as little as they possibly can. So there's all this value that's being created by workers. You know, when I work for, some, you know, when I work for maybe a company or something, I'm creating value for that company. 
and that value is going directly to the owners. It's not going to, you know, none of that value really goes to me at all. They pay me what they have to pay me, or what they can afford, you know, not to pay me, you know. So, obviously for like certain highly skilled jobs, they're going to pay you more, but you're still creating a lot more. At that point, you're still creating a lot more value for the company that you're not, you know, that you're not entitled to under capitalism. So, uh -huh. it's not, it's not, uh, when people say that capitalism is about innovation, that it's about mar the free market, these are not really things that um, that capitalism is uniquely like entitled to. Um, so one of my favorite alter you know alternatives to capitalism is the idea of a worker cooperative, which is a model that's been around for like a hundred years, or at least. And that's what we are here. We're a worker cooperative. So it's actually a, a worker cooperative is a um, it's the type of company that is owned by all the workers and it's controlled by all the workers. So um, there's, you know, actually it's one worker, one vote to make all like kind of major decisions for the company, and then it's owned by the workers. So you know, things like profits and stuff are are divided among the workers in a way that's democratically decided. So I get what you're saying, but uh -huh. as far as a business owner. Why would I build the business and then give the workers all the, all the same profit shares that I get? And that's the, that's the only problem with socialism is that, well, then why would people build this just to share with everybody else? Uh, well, I mean, it's not that one person, you know, you have to think of it in another way because it's not like one person can build up a whole company, you know. On the one hand, one person can start a business, right? right? But when you talk about expanding to be like a whole company, you know, one person can't do all that by themselves. You know, like even with this, even as much as I've done over the years with this, you know, I can only take it so far by myself. And um, I'm looking forward to maybe in the next few years turning this into a worker cooperative where I'll have, you know, a small group of people. And, you know, maybe at the beginning, maybe I will get a bigger share to compensate me for all the work I've done in the past or something, but um, that's something that would be democratically decided too, is, you know, there would be a meeting about it and we'll say, well, what is, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to handle this situation that I put time in and there's other people coming in now, but um, you also have to look at it from a perspective of, as a startup, you can have more people starting up and pooling their resources together. Um, to start up a worker cooperative, and so you don't have to start up, a, you know, a business by yourself. You can start it up with a group of people that has the understanding of, yeah. hey, we're going to do this together, and we're going to all benefit. Well, socialism is a funny thing, man. It's, most people look at it at the, in the same breath as communism, mm -hmm. and that's why socialism gets a bad rap in America, mm -hmm. because people tend to group socialism and communism mm -hmm. in the same, you know, pot. And there is a difference, you know, and people kind of need to educate themselves more on what actual socialism is. Mm -hmm. But as far as with us in America, we've, we've been in a capitalistic system, so it's going to be damn near impossible to go socialist after all the greed and all the corruption that we've already been through. Mm -hmm. There's too much, 2% has 98% of the money, and that right there makes it impossible for us to, to kind of adapt to that type of scenario. Yeah, it depends on your perspective. Um, it does get into some, it does start to talk about some uh, deeper topics at that point, because, um, well, to touch on earlier, I mean, Socialism, uh, based on my understanding, is socialism can be defined in a sense by anti-capitalism, right? So mm -hmm. capitalism is, like I said, it's the ownership. Uh, it's where the ownership of capital basically entitles you to the, to prof to all the profits of the of the business. Mm -hmm. And uh, socialism is all about worker ownership. So the workers create value for a company, and therefore they should benefit from it. And um, what we think of today as communism, which maybe you could point to, like, 
countries like the Soviet Union or maybe like Cuba or South Korea. Um, That's more of a dictatorship. Well, North North Korea, yeah. Um, what we could really call that is state socialism or authoritarian state socialism. Um, but honestly, if you look at a lot of the history, and I'm not uh, too well versed on enough of it, but um, when you look at a lot of the history, you know when. You